In order for us to integrate spirituality with the other aspects of our life, it's important to have a regular routine for spiritual practice. You know, we have routines for lots of things in life. We wake up in the morning and we brush our teeth. We have regular time for meals. We have routines for exercise and working out. A lot of what we do is about routines. The same is true for spiritual practice. When we have a routine, we're able to integrate spirituality with other dimensions of our life, like with our relationships and our work and with the environment. So developing that routine is important. Today I'm going to talk about my routine, as well as some specific practices that I do, like meditation and spiritual reading. So this is a great time for you to subscribe to this YouTube channel, as well as to click that bell so that you're notified of future videos as they're uh, published. Each morning, I have a routine. I get my cup of coffee and I go to a front room in my home. My home faces east so that when I'm in that front room, I often experience the sun as it's coming up over the horizon and the light fills that room. So that's a great part of my morning routine, but it's not the most important part. I spend about 20 to 30 minutes every morning doing spiritual practice. I begin that time with a sense of gratitude for the day, that I'm starting the day and looking forward to what's going to occur in that day. I express my thankfulness just for being alive, that it will be a good day. I then take time for quiet and for something called spiritual reading, where I, I dialogue with the text, and I'll talk about that later. But really, the important thing here is that I have this routine every morning, that I have time when, that roots me, that gets me set in the day, that gives me a sense of stability as I move into what all will happen that day. This routine, this habit is so important that I include it whenever I'm traveling, if I'm in a hotel room for a conference or for something, or if I'm even on vacation. If I'm vacationing with my partner, I get up before he does, and then when he's in the bathroom doing what he's doing, I have about 20 minutes when I can engage in my spiritual practice. It's just that much a part of me that I have to do it every day. I realized at one point that I actually adapted this routine from something my mother did. Every morning she would take her coffee and sit in a room in our home in a chair that looked out a window into the backyard. And our backyard was a large field. In the middle of the field was a large maple tree. And she would sit there for about 20 minutes. And she was not to be disturbed during that time. That was her time. She talked about it as needing her time to focus and get herself together. It was so important for her that later in life, as she cared for my father with Parkinson's, who was bedridden with Parkinson's for about five years, she told my father that she would be there for him any time he called, day or night, except for that time in the morning when, that she needed for herself. In other words, her spiritual practice was so much a part of her and was so important that she needed to start her day in that way. Psychologists tell us that we form habits by doing things, the same thing, for 30 days, for a month. In order to incorporate spiritual practice as a routine habit for yourself, it's important that you take a period of 30 days and do the same practice every day. Now, you don't need to do 20 or 30 minutes the way I do each morning. Whatever it is you do, even if you do it for eight or ten minutes every day, it will become a habit for you. What's important about spiritual practice isn't the length of time for any one period. Instead, it's that you do it regularly so that if you have a daily habit, a daily practice, just like brushing your teeth, that it becomes incorporated into your life and you'll begin to experience changes within your life in very positive ways. 
In addition to my morning routine, that morning period of practice, most afternoons I'm able to take a break for about 20 minutes from my work around three or four in the afternoon. I take that time as a time for meditation. Now, I began doing meditation whenever I was quite young. I went to Catholic school and the nuns took an interest in me. And whenever I was in middle school years, they taught me some basics of meditation. Now, being at a Catholic school, there was a Catholic church. And if you go into a Catholic church, there is a candle that's always lit towards the front of the church. The nuns taught me to go into church and to sit and be quiet and fix my gaze on that lit candle. And as I was looking at that candle, just to allow myself to get quiet, and then when I felt myself getting quiet, to close my eyes and take that quiet inside of myself and to just sit there. They call that the prayer of presence, of just being present in that moment. We call that today a form of meditation. Today, even though I have learned meditation in lots of different techniques and I'm familiar with different techniques and have done them, I have a default position, a default setting for meditation. That's what I use as my daily practice. It's sort of like Buddhist breath meditation and it's sort of like Christian centering prayer, but it's not really either. It's a, a loose combination of some aspects of both and it works for me. It's what, as I said, it's my default setting. So that whenever I take my time for meditation in the afternoon, and on a work day, it's a 20 minute break from my work, I sit in a straight back chair with my back straight, because your spine rests better that way, feet flat on the floor, with my hands in an open position on my lap. I close my eyes, and first I take a few deep breaths, and, and that's important for me because I generally have been working and I need to just sort of let go of whatever all has been happening in my work day. And as I get quiet in, after those few deep breaths, I begin to repeat a word as I exhale. That word may be peace or it may be healing. Lately I've been using the word open, and by that I mean I simply want to be open to what's happening in that period. And I allow myself to go into that deep quiet. What's important to remember about meditation is that there are always distractions around us. Some of those are distractions are inside of us and some of them are outside of us. Inside of us, our brain is always working, so we'll always have thoughts and we can't stop those thoughts. The only way to stop our thoughts is to stop our brain. And if we stop our brain, then we're not going to be alive. So we're not going to stop our brain. Instead, we need to learn to not pay attention to those thoughts. So when I become aware that I'm paying attention to thoughts, and that's the key, when I become aware that I'm paying attention to thoughts, I return to that word. I begin repeating peace as I exhale, or healing as I exhale, whatever my word is for that day. In the same way, if I become aware of a noise outside, a car horn as it's driving down the street or a bird tapping on my window, whatever it may be, I focus my attention back by using that word and repeating it as I exhale. I use a meditation app that I'm able to adjust to a very simple setting so that it works like a timer on my cell phone. At the end of the appointed time for the day, which is typically 20 minutes, it will sound a gong three times. It's a pleasant sound, as opposed to the alarm that rings if I'm using the, uh, you know, the other timer. So the pleasant sound signals to me that my time for meditation is over, so I take a few deep breaths and express gratitude for the time I've spent and become aware of sitting in the chair and open my eyes and begin to get back to whatever it is that I need to do. There are some days when my schedule is such when I can spend more time in meditation. 
and that's great. But given that I'm working in the afternoon, having 20 minutes is, you know, that's a good portion. Again, the amount of time isn't the issue. The regularity of the practice is important. But with meditation, you can be benefiting from a practice, even if it's just three days a week, basically every other day. But developing a regular practice is really an important thing for meditation and for other spiritual practices. As I began, I was talking about spiritual reading. Spiritual reading is different from the typical kind of reading we do. Spiritual reading is allowing a text to speak to us, to ruminate on a text. It's a contemplative practice. Typically, when we read, we read for information. We want to learn things. We want to find out about things. Spiritual reading isn't about learning things new out there. It's about allowing a text to speak to us to ruminate on it and to find meaning for ourselves in the words. So with spiritual reading, it's often good to set a period of time in which you're gonna be reading, doing the spiritual reading, as well as to select a text that's right for you. So some people use a sacred text like the Bible. Some people use poetry, like maybe the poetry of Walt Whitman or another uh, great poet. Uh, or people will use a text like one of uh, Pema Chodra's books. She's a Buddhist writer who writes in a way that's both simple but has really profound meaning. So you select a text, and out of that text, you select just a short portion, maybe three paragraphs. There are some very simple steps to spiritual reading. Of course, you get yourself quiet, maybe a few deep breaths. And then you take that portion that you're going to read that day, maybe those three paragraphs or that one poem, and you read through to get the context, you understand what's being said. And then you go back to the beginning and begin to read slowly, word for word, and allow each word to speak to you and, uh, and stay with it. So if a, you stay with a word or a phrase or an image, for a minute or for 10 minutes, that's fine. Until you find like whatever struck you has resonated within you. At the end of the time, which may come before you finish the portion you selected, go back and read through those, that selection, those paragraphs or the poem again, and use that as a way to sort of bookend the experience. So I wanna share with you uh, a quick example, and I'm going to be moving much more quickly for the sake of the video, using a text that I have used frequently for spiritual reading. It's the poetry by Hafiz. Uh, this collection is called The Gift, and the translation is by Daniel Ladinsky. Now, Hafiz lived in the 14th century, a Persian. The Sufis, while they come from Islam, are a universalist tradition. They understand God is universal to all people and people having a universal experience of God. Um, Ladinsky writes a very fresh translation uh, that's uh, very alive and, and really captures Hafiz's dynamism. Hafiz was passionate and about love and about experiencing God in nature and people. And, you know, um, it's just really rich with meaning. The poem that I'm looking at today, I'm just going to look at the first few lines of a poem called Now is the Time. And I'm going to read it through once, just the portion, not the entire poem, and then go back and reflect on some of the words and the way that the words may stand out for us in spiritual reading. Now is the time to know that all you do is sacred. Now, why not consider a lasting truce with yourself and God? Now is the time to understand that your ideas of right and wrong were just a child's training wheels to be laid aside when we finally live with veracity and love. Okay, you see, it's very rich. So we go back and begin reading slowly. Now is the time to know. Now, right now, in this moment. 
to know, to take into ourselves, to understand. Everything you do is sacred. Wow. Brushing my teeth, washing the dishes, grocery shopping, cleaning the toilet. Everything I do is sacred. Who would have thought? Why not consider a lasting truth with yourself and God? Interesting. Not a lasting truth between yourself and God, but with yourself. No more struggling with yourself. No more struggling with God. Just being a truce, a white flag a cessation of all tension. Now is the time to understand that your ideas of right and wrong were just a child's training wheels. Huh. I've spent so much time trying to do the right thing, doing it the right way, being the person I think I should be. I should lay that aside. Finally live with veracity and love. Whoa. Just living with love. Doing it with veracity. That changes how I see myself and my relationships, my work, the environment. It changes everything. And then when you're done, go back and read the portion again. Spiritual reading draws us into the text. It takes us out of ourself. So you could sit with any of those phrases for quite a long period of time. On the other hand, on different days, it may not impact you so much, and that's okay too. The importance is really taking the time to reflect, to be to develop that pattern. So we've talked about developing the pattern and doing meditation and spiritual reading. I hope you find some of those ideas helpful in a way of reconfiguring your spiritual life. You don't need to do what I do, but get some ideas to develop the path for yourself. Thanks for being here. Subscribe, leave some comments, click the bell, and look forward to more videos where I'll talk both about spiritual practice as well as leading life in a way that helps us live more dynamically and work through the way in which we embrace life as whole.